Hi, I'm Erin Power. And I'm Laura Rupsis. We're certified health coaches, and this is Health Coach Radio. This podcast is about the art, science, and business of health coaching. We share our insider tips to help you become a better coach and entrepreneur. And we interview expert guests to discover how they've made it in this growing field. It's time for health coaches to make an impact. It's time for Health Coach Radio. Today's episode is brought to you by the Health Coach Success Virtual Masterclass. My co-host Laura and I worked hard to pull together this special online event just for you. It's a five-day mini course in which we interview the best and brightest health coach and marketing experts on the planet to try to understand how they've become such great coaches and entrepreneurs. Included in the 20 plus expert interviews are some names you might recognize. Primal Health Coach Institute founder Mark Sisson, celebrity nutrition expert and New York Times bestselling author JJ Virgin, author, cardiologist, and staunch health coach advocate Dr. William Davis, Michelle Liotta of Health Coach Power Community, Michelle Norris, CEO of Paleo FX and ID Life Nutrition, and many, many more. The Health Coach Success Virtual Masterclass is now available and totally free for a limited time. Check it out at primalhealthcoach.com forward slash success. Today we're welcoming Dr. Kate Shanahan. Dr. Kate authored one of the must read nutrition books that every health coach ought to have in their library, Deep Nutrition. Well, she's also recently come out with her newest book, The Fat Burn Fix, and we talk quite a bit about that in this episode. Dr. Kate's area of expertise is in metabolic health, and we wanted to fast track releasing this conversation for you since metabolic dysfunction is such an alarming risk factor for the COVID-19 virus. The comorbidities that seem to correlate with the highest death rate from the virus include obesity, diabetes, and hypertension, all metabolic diseases. For the health coach working in the metabolism space or anyone who wants to understand how a healthy metabolism can set us up for optimal health beyond just looking hot in a swimsuit, and how being metabolically healthy is a necessary baseline to make it through pandemics like coronavirus and others, and there will be others, this episode is jam-packed full of awesome nuggets. Remember that the show notes for all of our episodes can always be found at primalhealthcoach.com slash radio. We hope you enjoy our conversation today with Dr. Kate Shanahan. All right. I am so excited to have you here, Dr. Kate Shanahan. How are you? Hi, I'm good. Thank you so much. Awesome. I've been looking forward to this conversation. There's, it's a very timely conversation with just what's gripped, I guess, the public's attention over the last several weeks, right? And, um, just regarding the overall health and what we know about um, how this COVID-19 has gripped the nation and who the people fundamentally are at risk. And just knowing your background as a doctor, what you specialize in, what you're passionate about, this couldn't be any timelier. So I, we're going to dig into a lot of this stuff, but for those that don't know you, and you know, it's probably a small portion of the people listening, we like to start every interview with just a three to five minute backstory on who Dr. Kate is. How did you become a doctor? How did you get to where you are today? Uh, My dad was a doctor. And when I was growing up, I just loved how my mom would be asking him questions about my sick little brother or little sister, whatever. and, And he would be able to, she'd be super anxious. And I could see that anxiety melt away when she got you know, my dad's input or advice about whatever was going on with him. And I wanted to be able to do that for people. I just thought that was the most amazing thing I'd ever seen. And I wanted to be able to learn to do that. And so ultimately I went to medical school after my dad actually tried to talk me out of it <laughs> but uh, because, I, I, you know, there was this idea of a physician glut at the time and he had visions had I had visions thanks to him of me like standing on a uh, like f- soup lines right because I'd be out of work or something but anyway so I, I couldn't help going to medical school I just was so interested in biology um, and uh, and and human health and physiology and just the connection between um, the little and the big right the very little meaning ourselves and how we end up growing and feeling. And I uh, had this like really kind of naive fantasy that I would be able to get to the underlying root cause of some of my own health problems, which Mm -hmm. were 
largely sports and sports injuries based on connective tissue. Um, and uh, that was not, that didn't happen long story short, but uh, fast forward, I was practicing in Hawaii and I got a real severe version of, of yet one more injury. It was, but it was like nothing I or anyone had ever seen. I was actually getting fevers. I couldn't walk. I had to have patients come into the room to see me instead of me going, that's how bad I was. I had surgery, it didn't help. There was something wrong with my knee. And it turned out, I think now that it was um, a virus because my immune system was not able to eradicate this virus. So um, my, you know, first and foremost, um, interest in this was selfish, my own. It wasn't like weight loss. A lot of doctors now who have gotten into it have done it because they've lost weight. But for me, it was just optimizing my health. And um, I was on Hawaii at the time. And so what that was, what that did that was, I think, unique was allow me to see a window into not just my patient's family health, but a transgenerational change in health that was taking place um, all around the world as we had abandoned our traditional ways of eating um, that had kind of been compressed into a time window that you could actually see in the space of two or three generations on Hawaii because in the seventies, Hawaii didn't really even have electricity everywhere. So people were, you know, without, imagine life without a fridge, mm -hmm. um, you know, uh, imagine life without a real efficient stove. So you would have to cook very traditionally. You would have to get your food very traditionally and very regularly and very fresh. And so I had the opportunity to see what happened when we uh, dramatically altered our food supply from the way people had been eating for the past several thousand years, if not longer. Um, Cause it wasn't like paleo way of eating. It was, you know, a slash of a combination of a little bit of farming, a little bit of fishing, a little bit of hunting, a little bit of gather. It was like all kinds of strategies. And that's where people were in Hawaii until very recently. And so I was experiencing the, um, dramatic change in my own patient's health as the generations progress. So I have, mm -hmm. I had 60 and 70 year olds who were healthier than their own children and grandchildren. Wow. So they were able to do pretty much heavy labor jobs. And yet their children were unable to play soccer without, you know, barely without needing surgeries for patellofemoral problems and all kinds of, um, weird problems. They had asthma and food allergies and everything. And the standard like list of childhood diseases that is now so common. Um, but yet their grandparents were like these shining examples of stellar health. So that's where I got into it. And, and that's how I um, started writing. My husband and I started writing uh, the first book together called Deep Nutrition, Why Your Genes mm -hmm. Need Traditional Foods. And we, we kind of summarized like it's almost like I kind of call it like an updated version of a paleo diet, really, because we do include strategies that were more modern per se, you know, like where people were raising their own animals, not always hunting everything and um, and gardening and stuff like that. And we also talk about the cooking and the culinary and um, food preservation techniques. So so that like because that was happening right in front of us in Hawaii and because um, my husband likes cooking. We were watching a lot of travel cooking shows and we could, that was also like a window around the world into what was common between all these traditional cultures, cuisines, because you don't have to, I mean, you can go back and, you know, to the Paleolithic era and see how healthy people were, but their people were massively healthy up until a hundred years ago. Right. I mean, you know, maybe not at, in the same, like, exact way, but compared to, it's a great place to aim for, <laughs> you know, and we have a lot of detail on how to do that. And so that's what deep nutrition was really about. Um, and, and I, uh, unfortunately it radically changed my medical practice to where I became a square peg in a round hole. It was very difficult to stay within the system. So after, after I wrote that book, I started this fruitless search for a hospital system that would employ me um, to actually make people healthy. The hospital systems have really zero interest in, in making people healthy. They want to make people chronically slightly ill. So they go in and out of the hospital with great regularity and need all kinds of procedures and, of course, um, sign up for prescription drugs on a regular basis too, because the hospital systems are, um, you know, their interests are aligned with the pharmaceutical interests. So, 
Um, so that was difficult. Those were the difficult years. Like I moved from 2010 to until here, actually, I think we moved like five or six times. It was really hard on us economically and everything. Lee. Um, but now I'm in Florida working for a company where I've hired specifically to take whatever time I need and do whatever it takes to make all the employees of this company as healthy as they're interested in becoming. Um, and try to help him get interested in becoming healthy, which is a whole other um, skill set. <laughs> right. mm -hmm. So, um, so that's what I'm doing now. Wow! Oh, love it! I love it. And like that whole explanation, especially towards the end there, where you're talking about hospital systems and how their motivation is very similar to the pharmaceutical industry. And uh, we, we interviewed one other doctor very early on with Health Coach Radio, Dr. William Davis, who holds a very similar view that you have, right? That um, the conventional medical system is really knows nothing about getting people healthy, right? They know about maybe how to help treat illnesses, make them manageable, and they're motivated to make them manageable rather than curable, right? right. And his stance, what this is what health coaches are for, that health coaches actually know more about actually being healthy right. than doctors do. and. I just, I, I wrote down ex kind of what you said here, and I'm wondering the, gosh, the universe that we're in right now, the, the situation that we're in right now, holy cow. It's like we're on steroids with all well, this. Exactly. I mean, it's, it's like, okay, so we've been living in this state of chronic illness that worked out really well for the hospital system mm -hmm. because it was keeping their beds full and it was keeping the doctor's office churning through people. It was keeping the drug companies happy and the, all the, uh, the, the interventions, medical interventionalists happy. And now we kind of, oops, we overshot it. Now yeah. people, because of this uh, virus, the coronavirus, now we've made people a little bit more unhealthy than the whole system is designed to handle right? Because we didn't see this coming, although some people argue we should have, but, um, you know, because pandemic, pan pandemics do happen. Yeah. Um, yeah. It's, like I say, just a matter of when, not a matter of if. And so now though, that we've got so many sick people, um, we're overwhelming the part of the system that is like what is now the most life-saving part, which is the intensive care units and the ventilators. Um, because if people are going to die from this virus, it's, they're going to die of a complication of pneumonia known as acute respiratory distress syndrome, which basically you're, it's like you're drowning in your own fluids. Um, and that, if you get that, like the death rate of that used to be 50 to 80%. Now it's down because we have much more sophisticated ventilator techniques, but um, it's still high, it's ridiculously high. And, and so now we have all these people who are... Um, who have underlying conditions, mm -hmm. um, and that's something I really want to dive into, um, who are getting so sick that they do need intensive care, that they cannot live through a pneumonia unsupported. And, um, you know, back in 1917, um, when they had the Spanish flu, um, that's kind of where we've, where we are now a little bit. It's a, different in that, um, the young people were way more affected because at that point in time, the old people had had immunity from a similar flu. And so a lot of children died. My grandmother was one of the few surviving one-year-olds at the time. Wow. Um, but um, so, so now we have it kind of the other way around where um, anybody who's like over 30, it seems to me, um, who has any kind of underlying condition is at risk for getting such a bad pneumonia that they need to be in the intensive care unit. They cannot survive a pneumonia without medical support. And you know, the, the children that were killed in um, the Spanish flu were young. They didn't have a developed immune system. Like the infant mortality rate was massively higher than any other age group because of the lack of the immune system. Well, now we have adults with a damaged immune system. And I really wanna kind of unpack why the age groups are the way they are. There's two big reasons. Um, and one has to do with metabolism and the other has to do with the virus itself. Okay. Um, but, you know, the, that, before we even do that, there's, there's some um, maybe practical stuff that anyone can do without 
having to overhaul their whole lifestyle and it will work, you know, quickly. And I think it's just bears mentioning maybe. Yes. Oh my gosh. It absolutely bears mentioning, please. (laughs) So one of the things that I tell all my patients when they just have a cold is um, now's not the time to load up on vitamin C from juice. Mm-hmm. Because juice has so much sugar, and I don't know how many people, um, have, when I've said that, have said, "Oh my God, I've been drinking like gallons of orange juice." Thanks for telling me. So, like a glass of orange juice has about as much sugar as a glass of soda. Mm-hmm. So that's going to suppress your immune system. And if there is any special benefit of vitamin C, um, you're you're out way outweighing it by all the sugar. If you want to get vitamin C, there's uh, healthier ways to do it. So, for example, like you know peppers, like red bell peppers um, have tons of vitamin C. Uh, Like I think a single green bell pepper has three or four times more vitamin C than an orange, right? Mm -hmm. So so that's one huge piece of advice is watch your sugar. So that's very basic for all the health coaches, but I think it's just a lot of people, you know, the health coaches have... Uh, have to tell people that, that you have to, that's kind of like one of the first things that, that you should tell folks because um, th- they don't know, they have this assumption that, that, you know, juice is healthy, fruit juice is healthy. So when you're working with people, just work with their assumptions. So that's a big, big, big one. And then the other, the other big thing, uh, sorry, I'm talking too much. Let me like, no, you're not. We love it. <laughs> okay. Mm-hmm. Thanks. Um, the other big one is sleep. So, um, another thing people relate to this, uh, how, how many days does it take your kids to get over like a flu or, a, you know, a mild viral infection? And they usually say like one or two. And I say, well, what are they doing? They're sleeping all day. I'm taking care of them. What are you doing when you have a cold or a flu? Well, I'm probably going to work because I need the money. Cause I just missed working care of my kids, um, or taking care of my kids. Um, you know, mm-hmm. so you don't, they don't sleep and, not only do you need a normal amount of sleep, which most people don't get, you know, very few people that I speak with get more than six hours of sleep. And we really need, you know, all the research keeps saying you do better when you get eight. I don't care if you feel fine with six, you do better cognitively and everything that's measured with a little bit more. Um, And then when you're sick, your body's trying to all those aches and pains and headaches and stuff that you kind of like blow off because you're so busy. That's your body trying to protect you from the virus. Um, It's trying to give you the edge over the virus by letting your body do almost nothing but deal with the virus. So Mm -hmm. it's telling you to go lay down. You don't even need to eat very much. A lot of times uh, suppressed appetite is um, actually with the the SARS or SARS two or the COVID-19 um, one of the most common, 50% of people actually have um, appetite changes and digestive uh, digestive um, system symptoms. And that hasn't really been talked about much, but it is even a presenting symptom. In other words, some people have no fever. They just have a stomach ache and, and a diarrhea or throw up. Um, and these are fortunately people who are tend to be pretty healthy usually very often, but they're unfortunately spreading it because they don't know because they don't have a fever and they don't have the shortness of breath and they don't have the cough. So they're going to work and they think, Oh, I just had some weird bug, 24 hour bug, but you're shedding that virus like mad for days before and days after doing that. So um, that's how this virus is spreading in spite of like all the quarantine efforts that we're doing. It's not really slowing down as fast as it should. Mm -hmm. But anyway, so staying home, staying in bed, um, trying to get as much sleep as possible. Um, I I recommend that um, parents get some sort of um, metallic version of silly string and just spray it all around your children and put them up like somehow in the corner or something like spiders do. Um, (laughs) That's my, you know, best recommendation (laughs) because... I don't know what else to recommend. Kids are a handful. Um, hope, hopefully, you know, once they're a certain age, they can kind of step up and understand that you're sick and, you know, take care of each other a little bit if you have enough of them <laughs> of the right age. But uh, it's not everybody's like, you know, about that. Um, so, um, so that's like the second big, big piece. And then another little piece is, hey, why don't we do some old fashioned um the Jewish penicillin, right? That chicken soup. The broth is going to really 
be easy to digest. If you get like chicken stock broth, you can even get the, you know, the store bought. If you can't have, don't have the energy to make it yourself, the store broth, true bone broths, not the ones that are made um, from bullion, like some of them at Whole Foods are, unfortunately. Um, those uh, have a lot of electrolytes and they have the ability to soothe your stomach so that um, it kind of supports your stomach health a little bit. And um, I truly think that the immune system begins in the stomach. And um, this is what I'm going to say next is totally unsupported by really any science, but that's a theory I've been working on for a little while. Um, one thing that happens with this virus is that it gives you a runny nose. Mm -hmm. You swallow the mucus mm -hmm. and that contains viral particles where your super smart immune system in your gut, it's like the best immune system we have, starts getting, a, you know, getting um, to know this thing. And um, there are some studies uh, from really old research. And I was just listening to an, another video with like a, a super old virologist who's got such a wealth of knowledge who was saying that like vaccines don't give you the same level of immunity as actually just exposing yourself to the virus and partly because of what happens in the gut. Mm -hmm. um, and so don't blow your nose so much, sniff and swallow. It's gross. But <laughs> I mean, it is what people did. We didn't have Kleenexes, you know, 300 years ago. Mm -hmm. Yeah. We only had kerchiefs and we can only have enough of those if we were super rich. So, um, so that, that, that's just sort of kind of like a hmm, theoretical, it might help, but um, it's a simple, simple thing to do. Um, and then another thing is uh, fermented foods. So this is kind of like my last of the, what am I at? Like four or five tips now. <laughs> I love it. Let's try. Um, so uh, fermented foods also help support your immune system in your gut because they have good bacteria living, flourishing right in them. And those good bacteria just kind of help um, support your immune system in a bazillion ways, including just outnumbering any bad bacteria that might be in there. And fermented foods also have other properties that we don't often talk about, which is just simply being acidic. So um, acid in the stomach helps to kill pathogens and um, they're also salty. And salt helps to stimulate some of the digestive uh, proteases that break down, uh, proteases are enzymes that eat protein. And so they can actually start eating the bacterial walls or potentially even the virus, the, these huh. proteins, um, just to break it down. So there's those three elements of fermented foods, the fact that they have live you know, the live cultured fermented foods, like cheese was fermented, it's not live anymore, but yogurt um, would be good. And um, uh, kimchi is kind of like my favorite. <laughs> um, it's super spicy too. And I think that some of the herbs and spices also have some beneficial properties, but um, uh, fermented pickles and fermented sauerkraut, mm -hmm. my faves. Wow. Love it. Okay. Awesome. Thank you for that. Because, you know, I, I, Laura and I were talking about this kind of off air, and I think it's a conversation that's been happening with a lot of healthy people. Um, like healthy people like us, we've been working on our immunity in a manner of speaking for our whole, you know, for, for whatever years, decades, however long we've been on this journey, we've been working on our immunity. I actually kind of uh, maybe rather rudely made a post on my Instagram recently that said the time to work on your immunity is before. Right. But but this is great because what we, we there's there's really a lack of language right now around what you can do in the in the actual moment right. to just sort of shore up some some acute immunity, if you will. Would you say that these tactics that you suggested would they work for kind of a, even a maybe an, an immune compromised or metabolically broken person, or is this mainly geared toward a relatively healthy type audience? They they should work for everybody. Awesome. Absolutely, yes. I wanted to circle back on the uh, on the first thing you mentioned the the vitamin C which we've heard we're hearing it's emerging in the in the upcoming in the current research that vitamin C specifically might be very particularly potent for this virus but that aside I want to talk about the sugar thing mm -hmm. because I um I have heard this so many times in my own health journey and just um my own sort of self experimentation and research that sugar suppresses the immune system in fact when I was in nutrition school they had a, they had a specific uh 
figures. Like it suppresses the immune system for eight hours. I, d- I don't know how they came up with that figure. <laughs> Can you speak to that a little bit? Like what is the mechanism there? And um, like how bad is sugar in terms of immune, immune suppression? Yeah. So actually I saw that very same thing and I looked into the research um, and this was like before I got really interested. I was like, well, okay, so this is a, this is a study that um, was done in white blood cells, like in a Petri dish. Mm-hmm. And I think it was just because it took that long for the, the sugar molecule to get used for energy. And, and yes, it did um, suppress the white blood cells like activity. Um, and I don't like remember why, but there was, so, so that does that apply to humans? Yeah, a little bit, because if you, uh, the difference, the key difference is that um, unlike in a Petri dish, we regulate our tissue and blood sugar levels. So it's never going to be able to be quite as high as you could make it in a Petri dish. Um, but that said, um, the spikes in blood sugar that most people get now when they have these massive infusions of sugar from juices um, or anything sweet, whether it's natural sugar or like from a Twinkie, it doesn't really matter. Your blood sugar spike is can be huge. And uh, so I've been doing continuous glucometer devices on um, a lot of my patients now for the past couple of months. And and especially if they have prediabetes, the spike can be huge. Um, but even in people who are healthy and like myself, I like to think that I'm metabolically healthy. But when I had two tiny little uh, pretzels, those little tiny small pretzels that were dipped in chocolate because we had some kind of a Christmas event and I was wearing the glucometer, my blood sugar sh- uh, shot up to 160. And that, I think that was partly because I hadn't had really anything sweet. And so my body had downregulated the production of insulin. So it's not like I'm insulin resistant. It's that I'm uh, insulin deficient almost, right? And so the next day when I did the same thing, um, it didn't happen that high. It didn't hmm. even spike at all. <laughs> you know, that's yeah. interesting. I, I, this is kind of it's on topic, but kind of off topic. So when I was pregnant with twins, I, I got managed to get knocked up in my forties and had, they happen to be twins. So now I've got two placentas. I know. And, you know, I took the glucose tolerance test for, with my first two children that were singletons, like 15 years earlier. And I, I didn't even dawn on me to maybe turn down the glucose tolerance test for my twins. I just metabolically was in a different place. I just assumed I'd pass it. Right. Cause I'm super healthy and I'm not diabetic. Well, I failed it miserably. Then I had to come back and take it a second time. Failed that one as well. Okay. Um, and I remember saying to my doctor, can we just pull an A1C? Can we do a different test? Because I know I'm not diabetic. And I tried to explain to her what my theory was that I just don't eat that kind of shit. Excuse my <laughs> language. I had the last time I sat down and had 50 grams of glucose, pure glucose. I don't like, I, I don't even know. <laughs> it's um, gross, right? <laughs> yeah. And so I had to go, I had to go see the dietitian and they, I, they had made me prick my finger four times a day. And all I did was go back. I just ate the way I normally ate. My blood sugar was fine. So my, my theory is the whole down regulation theory that I had gone 10 years where I just didn't eat that way. And then when I'm forced into this situation, my body's like, what the hell? Did you just do? So I, I guess I'm just looking for confirmation. <laughs> I think you're absolutely right. I mean, it, it makes perfect sense. Like you're not going to be insulin resistant because you're following a healthy diet. Uh, you're you're going to just simply be insulin deficient. It's just like anything else. If you if you practice it, you get good at it. So part of the thing that people do when they're practicing a high carb diet is their pancreas is practicing pumping out tons and tons and tons of insulin. And so what really they should have done if um, if they knew the whole story, which of course course they don't, um, is check your insulin level at the same time because and we don't, I don't know how much use it would be because they don't know what the normal is, but that's right. what needs to be done on it, on a population level. Uh, because you know, we really should understand, okay, let's take a person on a standard American diet. What, how do they respond insulin wise to this stuff? And I'm sure it's going to be drastically different based on their age and their weight and their, their body composition of polyunsaturated fatty acids in their body fat, which we could take that as a segue to the whole next conversation yeah. of um, underlying conditions. Yeah. yeah, let's do it. Okay, so underlying conditions for this COVID virus are are taking people who um, you know might just have like a bad flu or a bad pneumonia, or or maybe not even have a pneumonia, maybe just have a bronchitis or a sore throat, and making the virus worse. 
So if they are young and healthy, instead of just having a sore throat and not even really knowing that they were sick, they might feel like they might get an asthma attack or they might get a pneumonia. They might feel like they were hit by a truck and they have to stay in bed for 10 days. If they're even a little bit more unhealthy, instead of having that pneumonia kind of uh, presentation, which is what I just described, um, you get a, a, a close to respiratory failure kind of situation where you get short of breath. And these are the people that have to go into the intensive care units, which is the, the narrow, the, the whole like bottleneck in our system. That is the reason we are, uh, going into this financial crisis, Right. That's why everything's shutting down because we're trying to preserve that bottleneck, that intensive care unit access to ventilators. And so the underlying conditions now that are, are described are um, advanced age, meaning over 65, um, because people who are older have a less efficient immune system and the whole process of making antibodies and, and protecting themselves is a little bit slower. Mm-hmm. Um, so that's one. Um, and then the other accepted uh, ones, lists are a little different from country to country, but the one for um, this country is morbid obesity, meaning a body mass index of 40 or higher, mm-hmm. um, uh, diabetes, uh, hypertension, um, history of cancer, like current, basically currently undergoing uh, any kind of therapy for cancer. So a lot of people mm-hmm. who had breast cancer are still taking medications for it, even though it's not a radiation uh, or, or um, chemo type of treatment at that point, moment in time. Um, let's see, uh, f- fatty liver um, is another one, or liver disease, uh, kidney disease, and if I didn't mention hypertension, hypertension. Um, even gout was found to be one in another country. Um, and I think those are like, I'm hitting the mm-hmm. high points, but so some of the less common ones that are, that are like subsets of those, like pulmonary disease. So that would be asthma, especially severe asthma, pulmonary hypertension, which is something that a lot of people who have sleep apnea have. Um, sleep apnea is this disease where you basically, you, your airway collapses while you're sleeping generally because you're quite overweight, generally, not always. Um, and um, other kidney issues. So the main, you know, scary one, of course, is anybody on dialysis or has had a kidney transplant or has um, such bad kidney function that they have to follow dietary restrictions. That's the big group. But even just hypertension has been a risk factor. Mm-hmm. Um, and, um, you know, oddly enough, smoking doesn't always show up on the different countries' lists. Yeah, I noticed that too. <laughs> I wonder why that is. I'm not sure if it's that just people aren't asking about it, um, although they should. There's actually government mandates you have to ask, at least in this country. Um, but um, I mean, I think that uh, smoking uh, is nowhere near as bad as having a diet high in polyunsaturated fatty acids. So, um, so that I think is the real underlying condition that underlies all these other underlying conditions. Yeah. Yeah, well, I mean, uh, of the laundry list of of uh, underlying conditions you mentioned, the majority of them are metabolic or inflammatory in origin. Um, you know, it's, it's, was one too. What's, up, what's that? Pregnancy was one as well, also. Yeah. yeah. But it's it's not your Joe pregnancy. I mean, you know, I mean, many, many, many pregnant women. I think like at least a third of pregnant women now are diagnosed with gestational diabetes. So mm-hmm. that yeah. subset wasn't broken down. Yes. I heard on a different podcast, I don't have the statistic on the tip of my tongue, unfortunately, but they, they in comparing uh, COVID-19 patients in hypertensive groups versus non-hypertensive groups, it was like the, the difference in the mortality rate was just like, uh, you just, you can't ignore it. So hypertension specifically seems to be the one of the big ones that's getting a lot of press. But so, so morbid obesity, diabetes, hypertension, fatty liver, gout, ap- sleep apnea, all of these things can be linked back to metabolic dysfunction. And I know that I know from listening to you on so many other podcasts that this is for me, this is what you're the expert on is these polyunsaturated fatty acids. Can you talk us through how this is really the trigger for this full inflammation cascade that leads to this stuff? You said the word inflammation. So uh, polyunsaturated fatty acids are the unstable kinds of fatty acids that are uh, in very high concentration in the kinds of fats that we now eat more than we used to mm-hmm. and more than our bodies can handle. Um, and, and so this was the subject of 
this, the, the, the book that I just had published, which was the fat burn fix, I really took a deep dive into what does this stuff do that makes people gain weight and get diabetes? And, um, and the way I put it together is that basically, um, you know, without knowing it, um, foods in the grocery store have been depleted in their normal fats that should be in there. So like, instead of chicken with the skin on, you get boneless skinless instead mm-hmm. of um, ground beef, that's 80% lean, you get 95% lean instead of yogurt that has the full fat yogurt, it's fat free yogurt with tons of sugar. Um, and then it, we get a lot of the fat in the processed things that we eat. So obviously junk food, like, you know, you go look at most chips of any kind, cookies, crackers, candy, loaded with the polyunsaturated fatty acids. Um, and it, but it's also in foods that people don't think about. It should, you know, why would it even be there? So it's in pasta sauce, it's in salad dressing, it's in um, uh, dried fruit, dried vegetables, vegetable chips, mm-hmm. uh, many, many condiments, canned, a lot of canned food mm-hmm. uh, from artichoke hearts to uh, tuna. Um, so it, it's, of the average person's fat calories now come from these these, uh, seed oils. And the seed oils are super high in polyunsaturated fatty acids. So what's that doing to our bodies? So that's what um, the first thing I I do actually is I I talk about, um, maybe I'm not gonna be able to find it quick enough, but I have an image in the book where I show like the consumption of polyunsaturated fatty acids and how it's just shot through the roof. Um, compared to where it was a hundred years ago, um, it's like 10 to 20 times higher depending on the person. So, um, you can actually, so, so where, what does that mean? What does that do to us? Well, I think the most important thing it does, um, is it builds up in our body fat because we have nowhere else to store it. Mm -hmm. Either we're going to burn it for energy, build it into parts, or store it. No different than you know, protein or any other macronutrient. But the difference is we can't change this stuff. Like when we eat too much protein and we need to store it, you know, once it's filled up the muscle supply and it's gone into building you know, new parts for your skin and your brain and everything like that, we convert it to fat and ultimately store it. Um, and the same goes for sugar and carbohydrates. If we eat too much of those, we convert them to body fat and ultimately store them. And we not only can we convert them to body fat, we convert them to stable fatty acids, the mm-hmm. more saturated and monounsaturated kinds. And we're in control of that. We do that because that's what nature wants us to do because they're more stable and they're useful for energy. The polyunsaturated fatty acids, on the other hand, um, the omega-3 and the omega-6 categories um, are, we can't do anything with them other than, we can't change them, right? We can, we can elongate them, but they're still going to be polyunsaturated. Um, and once we do that, we can build them into brain or other parts that we might need. And we can burn them, but we can't burn them very efficiently. And that's a huge Hmm. problem that almost nobody is talking about. I think like myself and like hyperlipid and like one other person on the planet. Um, And when we store them in our body fat, they, you know, we store them as we ate them. Basically, Mm -hmm. if we ate an omega-6 fatty acid called linoleic acid, that's how it gets stored unless it degrades on the way to storage, which very often it does. They're so unstable. Mm-hmm. Um, so, so they build up in our body fat. Okay, so what, how, what does that look like? Well, at the turn of the century, the 1900s, somewhere around 1910, when they did biopsies of human body fat, meaning they took like a little, a little core sample of body fat and they ran it through an analyzer and looked at what are, what's the fatty acid profile back then, the polyunsaturated percentage was somewhere between two and three, most commonly, like some people went up to, you know, four or 5%, but mostly it was like two or 3%. And now they do the same thing. They've done it over the course of the entire century, actually. And over the course of the entire century, it's crept up and up and up. 
an exact parallel with how much it's crept up in our diet. Hmm. As you would predict, based on the fact that we really can't use it for anything, and so we have to store it. And so when you biopsy folks, the, the most recent study was done in like the um, 19, uh, or I'm sorry, the 2010s. And I saw levels that were 25% up and even like there was one kind of outlier that was close to 30% of that person's body fat was polyunsaturated fatty acids. So that's two to three times what it was a hundred years ago, presumably two to three times I'm sorry, what am I not doing? 10 times, not two to three times, sorry, um, what it was, and presumably more than what our bodies are really designed to be able to handle because it's so unstable. Mm -hmm. Right. Wow. right. So from, from an immune system perspective, um, this is kind of how I've, I've articulated to my clients when I talk them through, you know, where, what they're looking for and where they're, so you, you pointed out like all packaged and processed foods have these, these fats in them and they're, they're kind of everywhere. So I encourage my clients to get them out of their diets and where they can find them lurking. And when I get to the part about why they're bad, I always really simplify this language with my clients. And so I want, I just love, love your clarification on this in case I'm getting it wrong. That would be, but <laughs> like, the, the immune system can handle a certain amount of things, um, but when these dodgy fats come in, it's like the immune system wages a war against them because the last thing we'd want for these fats to do is like start assimilating in our cell membranes or our, our nervous system tissue. Is, the, is there any accuracy to that or am I completely off track? Um, you're, you've totally got the right idea that it, it totally interferes with our, our, our immune system function. Absolutely. Okay. Um, the, the, un, the instability part and in the inflammation is kind of like highly technical. And, you know, I mean, no one walks people through this. And, and I know what you've had to do is kind of translate what sounds like a bunch of chemistry to something that feels like meaningful information to a person. And, and that's totally good what you said. Um, the, the way I put it, I mean, cause I, I, I try to do the same thing. Mm -hmm. Um, is I say they're unstable and they promote inflammation. And the, every time I've said unstable, I want you to hear inflammation. Okay, well, what is that? What is inflammation? It means it's like a, a whole bunch of disruption, right? Mm -hmm. Your cells are trying to do one thing, but the inflammation gets in the way of it. It's like static. It's like chemical static. It's if you had a bunch of background noise and you're trying to hear like a lecture or something, uh, but there's a bazillion people, you're in a bar, you can't get that information the same way. That's kind of like what inflammation does to a cell. Um, that's kind of like what these polyunsaturated polyunsaturated fatty acids do to a cell because they're they're just they deteriorate they react with oxygen there's all cells are control freaks they need to be in charge of everything and so in that sense the average cell is slightly protected from the high diet or the high PUFA diet because they control exactly how much polyunsaturated fatty acid is in their own membranes and that's super duper important what they can't control is how much polyunsaturated fatty acid that gets delivered to them in the bloodstream from body fat between mm -hmm. meals. So what's the impact then? Let's, yeah. So let's say you've got someone who's been eating a high PUFA diet for decades, which is a lot of people. And then they decide I've had enough and they go on a diet. They, they change what they're eating and all that's great. But now they start shedding body fat and these, this body fat is now released in the system. What right. does that look like then? Well, if there's a lot of it, they're not going to feel very good once yeah. they get down a certain way. And I think a lot of this is the, 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 the keto flu or the low carb flu, I think is, doesn't happen. And people who don't have this stuff in their body fat are, are better fat burners for, could be for other reasons. But, um, but that's what it looks like is you don't feel so good when you go on a diet, you get tired. Mm -hmm. um, you uh, try to start exercising, but you feel bad from exercising like you feel a little bit good in some ways but then you feel so tired afterwards or you start getting a lot of you know joint pains you just can't keep exercising um because exercise is anti-inflammatory but if you're burning this poly you're you're trying mm -hmm. to burn your body fat and it's full of these polyunsaturated fatty acids 
they damage your mitochondria, which are the energy producing centers of your cells to the extent that they shut them down and they make you need more sugar as the alternative fuel. Mm. And so like what I just said there is why we have diabetes. So a, a lot of folks talk about diabetes, you know, back to COVID, totally relevant. It's the number one underlying condition that unites them all. I think more, more people have diabetes that um, haven't been diagnosed with it yet or pre-diabetes, which is really the same condition, just a less severe form, um, that have had these complications of COVID um, than we know about because a lot of people don't know that they have diabetes and very few people know they actually have pre-diabetes. Mm -hmm. um, but anyway, so the we talk about the cause of pre-diabetes and diabetes as being carbs. I'm sorry, that's not the cause. That's what raises your blood sugar so much more and makes you release a lot of insulin. They're not good, but they are not the cause. The cause is too much polyunsaturated fatty acid because that causes insulin resistance, which is the underlying thing uh, that you have to have before you get diabetes. You can't get uh, type two diabetes without passing through insulin resistance. And in experiments all the time, they use high fat diets that are high in corn oil mm -hmm. um, to induce insulin resistance in, in rats. They don't use high carb diets. Okay, you, you threw me for a loop there because when you were saying carbohydrate and sugar doesn't cause diabetes, I was gonna say ins or insulin, overproduction of insulin does. Uh, but then you said PUFAs do. And so I just want to understand a little bit the mechanism. Yeah. Could you, yeah, clarify that for us? That'd be great. Yeah. So um, it's a little bit theoretical because I'm like kind of put all this, uh, this stuff together in ways that there's not a lot of other validation, but it seems to be, this is the story that I've put together. Okay. Um, the When your body tries to burn body fat and it's full of PUFA, um, you, your the cells are sucking this like linoleic acid, polyunsaturated fatty acid out of the bloodstream. Once it reaches a certain threshold, it blows a fuse in mitochondria. It, it triggers the uncoupling um, proteins because it's so unstable. It basically the the reactions cannot be controlled, and you uh, you get you know free radicals flying all over the place, and it will damage the mitochondria to continue burning it. So to protect itself it stops doing anything. It stops producing ATP. Um, so what does it do instead to survive? Well, there's always sugar in the bloodstream and sugar mm -hmm. is a perfectly good fuel uh, compared to nothing, <laughs> right? It works very well. All you have to do is break it in half, six carbons, break into three carbons, take off the extra carbon, now shove it into the mitochondria and that mitochondria can, cut, can rev its engines back up and start producing energy. So what happens is cells start becoming sugar dependent. Yes. And they they kind of stop uh they they stop either they stop accepting fat or they just simply request so much sugar by putting receptors on the cell membranes and slurping it out of the bloodstream at a higher rate that now your body can't keep enough sugar in the bloodstream to fuel all your cells in this way between meals. So what happens? you get hypoglycemia symptoms. Mm -hmm. So, uh, um, I mean, I'm sure you guys know what those are, but just mm -hmm. review um, yeah. for your audience. Hypoglycemia technically means low blood sugar. People with type 2 diabetes have these symptoms when their blood sugar level is like 130, which is high. Yeah. Um, as you're developing diabetes, you get hypoglycemia symptoms even as your blood sugar is normal as well, even though you don't have diabetes. So what I'm talking about are the most important things you need to know about your metabolism. And this is in my fat burn um, factor questionnaire. How do you feel when you're hungry? So there's 11 symptoms of hypoglycemia and they include things like brain fog and dizziness and headaches. Do you get hangry? Um, hangry wasn't a word until <laughs> like 2010. Um, because when I was growing up, kids didn't get hangry. We just went outside and played longer. Mm -hmm. uh, because we could burn our body fat. But this hanger is really, it's the first sign of a severe metabolic problem that your body fat is not serving as a, a fun effective fuel. And now your cells are using more sugar than your bloodstream can provide. That is a huge problem. So your body is needing more sugar than your bloodstream can, can provide. So what happens? Um, 
and this is also kind of more into my theory realm, but like I say, there's evidence for every piece of the step. Um, your brain is the is one of the most sugar or energy dependent organs, right? So mm-hmm. when you start having difficulty supplying your brain energy, that's where you feel almost all of these 11 hypoglycemia symptoms are related to low brain energy. So your brain starts saying, I know biology and when I was born, a normal fasting blood sugar level was somewhere between 65 and 85, um, but that's not doing it for me anymore. So I'm going to take charge of the situation. I'm going to fix my own problem. I'm going to increase my fasting blood sugar level. What does that mean? I, my brain is giving you diabetes Mm -hmm. because that's how we diagnose diabetes and prediabetes. What is your fasting blood sugar? It's one of the ways. Um, And the way it does this is there's a nerve in the uh, appetite system, appetite control system of the brain that uh, is called the vagus nerve. And it directly goes down to the liver and it tells the liver to start pumping out more sugar, which it can do by converting protein. In other words, your muscle, if you're a diabetic, into sugar. So this is why diabetics have this skinny fat look because they're li- they have high blood sugars, not because not just because they're eating too much carbs, primarily because their brain needs their liver to convert muscle into sugar. Wow. Yes. Okay. Yay. Does that make sense? Yes, yeah. it makes so much sense. I'm, I just want to like jump on a couple of things there. First of all, um, just uh, anecdotally, insulin resistance is how I came to health coaching. So every every time we talk about insulin resistance like this, it just it just it's almost triggering for me. And one thing that triggered me um, that you mentioned because right now I'm writing some curriculum about uh, diabetes, prediabetes, insulin resistance. I have to write this curriculum, and it's a long story. But the way I have to write this curriculum is in line with the CDC's um, information, right? So I'm. I can't really go down the ancestral health models. I can't go down these sort of unconventional. I have to look at this very conventional Mm. um, material. And and as a, it is as somebody who was pre-diabetic, when I when I read that it's because I had low blood sugar, it's like no, I did not have low blood sugar. I I had nothing but sugar in my blood. Mm -hmm. (laughs) That's frustrating to me. Yeah. But, but thank you for clarifying, because so what I heard you say is that the PUFAs break the mitochondria. I mean, the mitochondria are broken. They're like, give us sugar. And so that, that triggers this basically insulin resistance cascade. Makes perfect sense. <laughs> what, are some, what are some of the other 11 symptoms? You mentioned hangry, brain fog. What are the other nine? Um, you might feel like shaky um, or anxious because what's happening, what that comes from is when your blood sugar drops, your uh, adrenaline and your cortisol uh, get released to try to kick in and loosen up some more energy in the form of sugar or body fat or whatever, and make that um, protein conversion happen quicker. Um, and uh, let's see, um, I think I said confusion uh, or dizziness is another one, fatigue, like some people just feel like they have to go lay down, uh, triggering a, a headache or a migraine is another one. Um, I've had to write it down because I can't, rem- I can't remember more than like five. Oh, that's a lot. And I, I think, I think these are all people, <laughs> liably. people that have, I mean, I think these are all symptoms that people can relate to and think I've felt that way before. Right. You know, or I'm feeling one, that way now. One that, that jumped out when I was writing this curriculum, I don't know if you guys, have, if you've ever heard this, Laura, if you've ever heard this in your patients, um, Kate, Dr. Kate, but nausea. Some people will say sometimes I get so hungry that I'm nauseated. Yes. Like that's, mm-hmm. that's, it's all that, that hangry, it's all that hangry spectrum and hangry is different for everybody, but even nausea and sort of uh, upset stomach or cramping, I think is even one that I've seen pop up in the, in the list. So, so what's the solution? So let's say we've got people that they, like they, they get this, they're buying into this. We've got some health coaches working with people on becoming fat burners. Mm-hmm. Right. Um, and it is what it is. They're feeling these symptoms. It almost sounds to me like you're feeling detoxification system sy- symptoms when your body is burning through these PUFAs and they're being released into the system. So how, if, so if you were going to talk to a health coach about how to help a client over those symptoms, how, like, is it, do you just have to wait it out? Are there things that a health coach can tell clients to do to help mitigate these? Yes. Excellent. So glad you asked. 
Yeah. So in toxicology, the solution is dilution. Okay. <laughs> um, and so um, what you're doing is basically you're going to be diluting out the concentration of these PUFAs by when the minute you stop eating them, that starts to happen naturally because anytime you store anything, your body can make the kind of fat that it gets stored as be either saturated or monounsaturated. So whatever it is you're eating, if it's a high carb diet, which I don't necessarily recommend. Mm -hmm. um, but um, the other thing that has helped a lot of folks when they are more metabolically damaged, like when their fat burn factor is on the lower side, like usually when it's under 50, but, um, uh, you know, under, so it goes from a scale of zero to hundred. So, um, when it's on the lower side, a lot of folks can't, um, like do, they don't do very well on a low carb diet or they can't do intermittent fasting. They can't skip a meal. Um, and so to help those folks, I actually recommend uh, like a step wise approach to this, right? Like, so if you're healthy enough, you can kind of dive into either keto or if you're super healthy, you can even just dive right into intermittent fasting if you want to. Um, but if you're not, uh, um, you really want to start with uh, the baby steps. That, so I have, I have two phases. And the first one um, is where you fix your metabolism and get ready to burn fat. And the second one called phase two is where you actually burn your body fat. So that's more about cutting calories with intermittent fasting because it's the easiest way to cook calories. But the first phase is broken into like a real slow approach. I call the baby steps and then the more accelerated uh, phase. And so the real slow approach there, I use uh, um, some, uh, we, we have to construct meals so that you can make it all the way to your next meal, right? Because mm -hmm. some people can't. Some people, right. they have a breakfast or a coffee or something, and then the mid-morning, they just get a, a snack attack and they go for something horrible. Um, or they can't like make it a minute past the lunch hour, right? They, so they have to, you know, if they didn't bring lunch, they're in trouble because they're just going to raid the vending machine. Yep. So um, the, the, the baby steps approach is understanding how to build a meal that's going to sustain your energy because you are in essence, living on a knife edge of energy excess where you're going to store too much fat and energy deficiency where you're going to feel bad when you burn your own body fat. So at that phase, that's, that's where people have the most trouble like with uh, keto diets and with intermittent fasting. And I tell you, people will tell me they're intermittent fasting, but because they're so metabolically damaged, they're not. They're having breakfast, a snack, lunch, and dinner. They'll tell me that they're doing time-restricted eating, but it doesn't count. Certain things don't seem to count because they make them feel better, th these certain things. And they just assume that it's like a deficit or it doesn't, for some reason, it doesn't count. And there's all these things going on uh, out there on the blogosphere is about like a fat fast. Yeah. Butter coffee all day <laughs> long. Yeah. That's not a fast. It's a mm -hmm. high fat meal. Mm -hmm. Um, so anyway, so with that kind of like misinformation out there, um, people are understandably frustrated as to why they're not losing the expected weight or getting really significant improvements in any way. Um, and so, so I help people that are that most metabolically fragile construct that balanced meal where you get the healthy fats that kind of drip out of your digestive system slowly enough where they will sustain you. They suppress your appetite. Um, so they don't make you hungry. Um, and something I call slow digesting carbohydrates, mm -hmm. which are like sprouted grain breads. It, these are carbohydrates that, um, break down slow enough where they also, it's kind of like a time release capsule for, for blood sugar. So that it takes a while to digest it either because it's high in fiber or high in protein or high in fat, but either way, the carbohydrate in the stuff, and this includes beans, um, is walled off behind protein and fat and fiber or cellulose. So it just takes a while to break it down. So it kind of raises your blood sugar enough to feel not hypoglycemic, but not so much that it spikes your insulin in a big way in a big negative way. So um, again, thanks to the continuous glucometer device, I can like, I'm, I was very gratified to see people um, helping me run the experiment and, and proving the theory that, you know, sprouted grain bread doesn't spike blood sugar just as predicted. Uh, right. But the same exact breakfast, even if it's kind of a high fat breakfast, if you have it on normal wheat flour bread, it does spike their blood sugar. Interesting. Cool. What are some other slow release carbs? Um, like nuts are fantastic. So, um, really any nut cause nuts are a well, seed, 
right? Mm -hmm. And the seeds have to be high in energy because they're going to have to sustain a growing plant. So that means they're going to be relatively high in fat. They're going to be relatively high in protein because they have to build parts for a plant and before it can start doing its own photosynthesis. And they have, they have to be kind of high in some kind of carb, um, but it's usually a starchy thing that's slow to break down and it's protected behind all these other structures that um, keep the seed as an, the seed is like a time capsule of plant life. It's dormant. Mm -hmm. It's all about dormancy and preservation and staying the same for a while. And so um, it walls off the sugar on purpose so that microorganisms like fungi um, can't start attacking the seed and basically eat the seed, right? The seed wants mm -hmm. to use that stuff. So, um, so as you germinate the seed or, uh, which is why I recommend soaking like beans and sprouting um, wheat, so eating sprouted grain bread, you dial down some of these anti-nutrients and you wake up the enzymes in a way that um, does reduce the carb content, but increases the nutritional value and the fiber value um, so that it just, um, so that it breaks down just the way you would want it to. But really the real reason that sprouted grain bread is um, better than flour bread is because it's whole and intact, it's not flour. Right. And that's how people originally made bread. That's how people originally used wheat. They would sprout it and ferment it. It was like a mix between pudding, porridge, and beer, mm -hmm. they call like beer bread, but it was really more like porridge. Um, and, um, and that is actually perfectly fine for even for diabetics. It doesn't really, it does bring their blood sugar up a little bit, but it doesn't, you know, maybe like 10 or 20 points and, and it still works for those people who are not ready for total like carb austerity of, you know, a keto diet. So. Oh. I love that. I love that you have this approach. Like you mentioned this a couple of times in this interview about um, looking back a hundred years ago, mm -hmm. which I really like. That's such a moderate approach uh, to the ancestral health movement, which is a movement that we can't, we're kind of all part of. Not everybody listening is a part of that, but for those of us who are kind of adjacent to that, you know, we talk about hunter gatherers. We talk about 2.5 million years of human evolution. That doesn't land with a lot of clients. So mm -hmm. we can say a hundred years ago, we right. made bread this way. Yes. And a hundred years ago, this is how our health looked and look at us now. <laughs> look at, just look at us. Right. right. I, I think that's really, th I, I really appreciate it and thankful that you just brought it back to kind of a more relatable duration of, of human life. Yeah. I think that, you know, the fact that, um, I mean, here I'm going to say something terribly sexist, but I think it's important. Um, guys don't think about cooking much, mm -hmm. do they? I mean, your average yeah. guy mm -mm. going to, kind of like not, it's going to be hard pressed to admit that they enjoy cooking. I mean, that's the average guy in my experience, my husband, <laughs> um, but um, that's what I'm talking about. So like we go from hunter gatherer to like processed food, right? In the, right. in the, the standard, <laughs> the original edition of uh, the whole ancestral health movement, because they don't think about cooking. They don't think about what had to happen after that carcass was drugged back home that somebody had to turn it into dinner mm -hmm. and sure. Yeah. Smoking and, you know, pit fire and all that, but they, we also gathered <laughs> right. and we had to do something with that. We had to do something with the bones that was a little more sophisticated. Um, and I'm sure men and women both at the time, but over the past 10,000 years, somehow or other, it, cooking became more the woman's job. And that kind of just gets bleeped over by most of the guys. And, and that's all deep nutrition was really trying to do was say, hey, you know, there's this thing called cooking and cuisine and culinary arts and um, making food taste good and not just gnawing on a leg um, <laughs> that we should be learning from because that actually is the hugest body uh, of nutrition science. And I think the only valid body of nutrition science is what do the cookbooks from a hundred years ago or more say that we did? Because when you look at them, they all, that's where I got the four pillars of the human diet from was looking at traditional cookbooks as well as a, around the world where people still pretty much did the traditional style. And so um, that, that's all that that is. That's the science that really, I think the only valid nutrition science we have is in those cookbooks mm -hmm. because the rest of it uh, is ignoring all that. And which is to say, 
acting as though we knew nothing about how to nourish people until the industrial right. era. Yeah, or, or acting as though we need we need lots of funded studies and research. <laughs> I know. It, I mean, I love like the new side pe people that they're great, but I'm sorry. We don't need another study. We need to pay attention to the evidence that we have right in front of us that we, you know, we're kind of born with actually let's start paying attention to that and stop pretending it's so complicated. It's really, really simple. I mean, that's why right. people on Hawaii did it. They didn't have, uh, you know, even a sixth grade education, but they knew how to feed themselves self-sufficiently. There's a lot of knowledge there that we're ignoring. I love um, how simple this first step is. Let's just figure out how to build a meal nutrient dense enough or satiating enough to get you to your next meal. Because this is something that comes up for me with my clients all the time is what kind of snacks can I eat? All the time, every single client, particularly in the beginning, I need snack ideas. And this is where from a coaching perspective, I have to get into the conversation of, Let's talk about that. When do you find that you have this need for snacking? Do you find you're really hungry? Here's some, you know, and getting into a whole coaching conversation. But step one for me is always, let's figure out how we can build you better meals to get you from one meal to the other without snacking. I love that. What is kind of, you were talking about this phase one, um, reconstructing the meals. What else can a health coach kind of help clients with? Well, I think in terms of that, um, my suspicion is that people want healthy snacks because they don't know how to make healthy meals mm -hmm. or it seems daunting. It seems right. implied is you're going to have to cook. So what I tell people is whatever you're going to snack on, that's your meal. Yeah. Right. Cause people are perfectly happy snacking on a bunch of nuts and, you know, uh, cheese and a couple random vegetables. People are, are perfectly happy doing that. So let's have that be your meal. Let's just not have it between meals. Let's skip that in between meal eating mm -hmm. business because there is no such thing as a healthy snack. <laughs> right. There just truly isn't. If you're trying to improve your body's ability to burn body fat for fuel, you're, you're just going backwards if you're snacking all the time. Um, or even, even once, you know, that's okay. Well, that was a meal. That was an opportunity that you had to do uh, like a mini fast where you were going to be burning your body fat for a little while there, but you just blew it because you had a snack. So don't do that. You don't really need it if you build your meals right. And if you just have some simple, super easy, like finger food, that's what I talk about in um, the fat burn fix is I have a bunch of these kind of real super, so easy a child could make it kind of ideas that that's what we need. That's what I do. The charcuterie board. <laughs> oh, <yeah>. I know. <laughs> My girls love that. We call yeah. it picnic, picnic yeah. dinner, right? Yeah. It's a bunch, huge yeah. plate full of a bunch of stuff. We avocado, olives, maybe I'd have some cheeses, some pepperoni, some nuts, some, you know, maybe we have some fruit on there and they just love it because we all sit around a low table together and we'll sit on the floor or, um, and it's just pick and they, it's just, it's fun. <laughs> it sounds very Asian, actually. The, uh, you know, when you go to like a, um, I had a Korean friend in Hawaii and she invited us over and we had like this smorgasbord of all kinds of weird little cups of things and we just ate from them and shared everything. So, yeah. I've heard, I've heard it's, and, uh, and those are all like a lot of fermented things, which are basically fast food too, right? <laughs> yeah. That's my favorite way to get ferments in is uh, my charcuterie board. But I've, I've heard it say that, um, if you have the urge to snack, then your meal didn't do its job. And that's what I try to teach my clients. Um, it's just a paradigm shift because they've been so used to the meal, snack, meal, snack, meal, snack, keep your blood sugar level paradigm. Oh, and I'm learning really. Yes, I know. We, we do learn the wrong things as doctors and dietitians, And it's, um, it's difficult to realize that we've learned the wrong thing. And so, you know, we're not going to give up on it, even though it's failing in front of our eyes. Unless you know do you know what I heard this week? You probably already knew this statistic. I heard this on a podcast this week because all the podcasts right now that I listen to are talking about COVID mm -hmm. and talking about how the metabolically dysfunctional are at great risk. The statistic I heard this week is that 88% of Americans are metabolically unhealthy. 12% of Americans are metabolically good to go. That's crazy. That, that sounds about right. And in fact, I might even say it's probably lower in the good to go category. And, um, you know, I don't know if they were talking about just adults, but um, it's what happens is these polyunsaturated fatty acids build up in your body fat over time, right? So um, when you're born, cells are control freaks, everything's regulated. 
So as much as possible, your body, that, that little baby, that the fatty acids in there is like a normal little baby fatty acid profile. But as time goes by, if you're formula fed, if you have, um, you know, a lot of uh, snacks and stuff like this, you you start building up too much PUFA in your body fat. And so I've seen, you know, teenagers who are pre-diabetic mm-hmm. and insulin resistant and a little bit skinny fat already. And, and so, um, you know, that I think it's, I think we have an epidemic of metabolic disease. I mean, there's no doubt we already know we have an epidemic of diabetes and prediabetes in, in the, the country, half of all adults are either diabetic or prediabetic half, whether they know it or not. And only, um, only one out of 10 doctors or one out of 10 patients with diabetes knows, has been told by their doctor, the, uh, pre-diabetes, I'm sorry, with pre-diabetes has been told by their doctor. So we have a, a bazillion people walking around that are already pretty far down uh, this, the, I call it the diabetes spectrum, right? So you start out, uh, you're healthy, you're fat burner. The first thing is you start getting this hangry hypoglycemia. Then you become insulin resistant. Then you become pre-diabetic. So that's three out of four, mm-hmm. um, uh, three quarters of the way down to diabetes. Um, nine out of 10 people are, and they don't know it. So this ties back to who's getting really sick from the coronavirus, because we have so many people that have pretty much severe metabolic damage. They're already three quarters and they don't even know it. So of course they're going to be seen as somebody with no underlying conditions. Right. You can be, right. you can be not, not morbid obese and be pre-diabetic. You can even be normal weight and be pre-diabetic. You're probably skinny fat, but you know, it's not going to reach the radar of a um, typical doctor listing out the statistics for the CDC to then come over and figure out who is really at risk. It's almost like the intake for people should be like, you know, asking about their medical history. Do you smoke? What happens if you skip a meal? <laughs> yeah, I seriously, it's, I would love that. <laughs> yeah, that, you know, that, it really kind of makes me wonder when you hear stories on the news about how otherwise healthy people landed in the hospital. Uh, by whose measure? Exactly. Right? Had they, they just haven't been diagnosed with something. In well, many- there was a one video from a guy who was like, I'm a healthy guy. And he was like a six foot four big guy. He was obviously obese, but he didn't think so because it, you know, guys, especially it's cool to be big and the bigger you are, the better. So I, I don't know how many guys have no clue that they are actually obese. Um, so, you know, that right there. And then, so even just that threshold of like, I'm sorry, dude, if you have 30% body fat, uh, or if you're, you're six foot four and you weigh, you know, 250 pounds, and unless you're a bodybuilder, you are obese. And, and, uh, you know, I know you don't feel like you're as fat as some other people that you see. And that's because that's what we're doing is we're comparing ourselves to everyone around us, but everyone, the average person is nearly obese. Mm-hmm. So, um, it just, it doesn't just, it just doesn't dawn on people. People literally have told me, I've sat in my office and they've told me their list of medications. Um, and they said, but I'm pretty healthy. <laughs> but their list of medications includes a heartburn medication, uh, a medication for their prediabetes, a medication for their hypertension, for their gout, for their chronic allergies and asthma, um, for their migraines, for their sleep problems. But you know, I'm healthy doc. Mm. Whoa, we have so lowered the bar. Right. <laughs> Right. I was, um, I was talking to someone the other day about, um, the, uh, Travis, con- uh, health, like illness, wellness continuum. Right. And that just because you appear to have like illness is absence, absent, right. Just because on the surface, you haven't been diagnosed with something that doesn't necessarily mean you're well, first of all. Right. right? <laughs> and second of all, j- lack of diagnosis doesn't necessarily mean you don't have an illness. It's just that symptomatically things have not been so bad that it's driven you to a doctor to run the right kind of tests. And right. Like, that. like there's a, like wellness is not just the absence of perceived illness. Right. Yeah. And this is where health coaches can come in. And one of my biggest, and, and again, it's because I have four kids, but the thing that scares the crap out of me is the number of parents that I see, even, even some parents that feed themselves pretty well, Mm. still feed their kids crap. They're still walking around with goldfish crackers and granola bars and, and fruit snacks. That's another one. You know, we are setting our kids up at a very early age for this overabundance of polyunsaturated fats from what's sitting in the dang Cheez-Its, right? 
an overabundance on sugar for fuel. And my, you know, the argument is, well, they're younger, they've got more time, they, you know, their metabolism's higher. Bullshit. They're littler than you. This is like a dose thing, right? They should actually have less sugar than you. They should have less polyunsaturated fats exactly. than you. We are setting our children up to not only, like, like and I guess where the mindset comes into with parents is, well, this is just a genetic thing kind of runs in the family. So what difference yeah. does, oh my God, no, right. you might have a predisposition, but if we can set our kids up now to make better decisions, we can forego all of that. But right now we're setting them up to, first of all, at the very least suffer from what we're suffering from now. And what's more likely is to be actually worse. <sighs> than we are Absolutely. because they're starting Absolutely. at a young age. Right, exactly. And, you know, they're born with, uh, you know, I mean, the, 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 the thing that, um, one of the things we talk about in deep nutrition is the idea of genetic wealth. And mm -hmm. that is something that your grandparents, you know, had built up or not over their lives because it was required mm -hmm. to survive. Like we didn't have antibiotics. We didn't have cesarean sections. We didn't have glasses for people who couldn't see very well 200 years ago, right? They mm -hmm. would say if they were a cowboy and they couldn't see well, they'd probably get shot in the head, you know, mm -hmm. <laughs> from my, at least according to the Westerns. So, um, but, but uh, you know, so people had to have this higher level of health and, um, and it, depending on their ability to access nutrition, you came into the world with uh, genetic wealth or uh, with a lot of genetic wealth or less genetic wealth. And, and I'm saying nothing about, you know, your value as a human being. It's just a, a reality of how healthy you can be. And this is my family. Like my, all of my grandparents, they didn't have to wear glasses. They didn't, they had straight teeth. Um, and, uh, you know, in my generation, three or four of us had to get braces, three or four of us had to, uh, uh, had to get, uh, wear glasses. And um, we have health problems that they didn't have. Like mm -hmm. I had all these connective tissue problems, but my um, dad is like, he's still, he's like 70, I don't know, eight now. And he's doing CrossFit. Oh, but yeah. I, I can barely do that because my um, hip is like disintegrates, deteriorated, and, and there's like no connective tissue holding it together in spite of my really good diet, because there, even though there's no inflammation, there's just no drive to build it anymore because I didn't have that genetic thing. Oh my gosh. Honestly, I, I heard you talking about this on Brad Kearns' podcast like this past summer, this connective tissue stuff, and it just made my, my head want to pop off because it's like a whole separate now I, you know, this, this, uh, aspect of health that... We, we actually, it's interesting to have control, like to imagine that you have control over it. Cause I'm, you know, I, I struggle with a lot of biomechanical breakdown as well, which I just assumed because I did too much stupid shit in the gym, but it, maybe it's just a consequence of my genetic wealth or whatever. Like it's just a, such another rabbit hole to go down. Yeah. But I think because we're getting close to our, our time here, just, just to kind of summarize, I, you have a, a new book out, Fat, Fat Burn Fix. I actually, I do this all the time when we're on podcast interviews. I will, I will buy the book while I'm talking to the author. So it's on the way here. <laughs> it's coming. Um, so talk to us about the book because it's, it's, it's important because what we've talked about this whole time is the metabolic um, implications for this particular virus. And the mm -hmm. Fat Burn Fix is a, is a, meta, a metabolism healing book, really. So tell yeah. us about the book, where people can find it, what they're going to get out of it. So you can get it um, on Audible from Amazon, and um, you can get it at all booksellers right now in, in hardback form, which looks like this. And um, the first thing um, that I think I want people to understand is that your metabolism can affect your personality. And if you, if you feel like you've got all these cravings you can't control, chances are good. It's your metabolism doing a lot more to that um, desire to have sweets and your self-control than you realize. And so the, the fact that you have control, your metabolism can give you control over your self-control. Um, and, and that's kind of like a virtuous cycle as opposed to like a vicious cycle or an unhealthy cycle where, um, okay, so you are got brain fog, so you can't figure out how to cook a healthy meal. You're just going to go through that drive-through just one last time today instead of going home and, you know, having a salad, which <laughs> you don't feel like <laughs> making because you're too tired. So literally there are studies showing that self-control is related to metabolism and basically brain energy. So, um, so that's kind of like one big gift that we haven't talked about. And of course, it's going to help you fight off all these other diseases. And, you know, if there is another pandemic, because there will be another one, 
um, you'll if you take start taking steps now, you'll be by next year the same time. If you are a diabetic, you can be free of it. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, sorry, you touched on something that's so important and just so such a. Um, it's, it's an adjacent concept. So here, and I, I don't want to belabor this, but my clients right now that I'm dealing with are, are, that I'm working with right now, they're dealing with what they're calling boredom eating, emotional eating, stress eating. I'm at home. I'm just nibbling all day long because I'm at home and I'm bored and I'm stressed out. It's like, you know, Aaron, I'm an emotional eater. I'm a stress eater. I'm like, no, I think you're just hungry. I think if you're well-fed, you, mm -hmm. that behavior would change. Like I, I, I really believe that our moods and our sort of pathologies around weird eating behaviors come down to being metabolically just not quite shored up yet. Right. right. And having the ability to engage in something new, right? I mean, that's how people survive when they're retired is if, if they have, people, they've done studies on this too. If people don't have like a purpose or meaning or a community to be able to always be learning new things or, or giving value to their community, they will die at a higher rate than people who do have that. And so we need that. But if our brain is like uh, not functioning properly because our metabolism is damaged, then it's hard to, it's hard to get engaged in stuff. And what's yeah. familiar is a lot easier. And so that's going to be sitting down, looking at the fridge, <laughs> going to the fridge to take a break. You know, the, the worst things for your metabolism, depending on what's, on, on, what's in your fridge. But, um, it, you know, so, so it is a vicious cycle. But um, the, the getting engaged, I think, is something that is a great tool for, for folks who have this kind of problem. And so I, I, I do a little my share of health coaching too. So I try to break it down for, for folks. Okay. Well, you know, I know you're after dinner, you kind of like have this draw back to the fridge. So there's two parts to that. One is a good part, which is you want to get up and do something. Mm -hmm. So forget the fridge, clean up your dishes. And it right. actually worked. This was a single guy. <laughs> he was like, no, we're done. I'm going to clean my kitchen. <laughs> <laughs> That's a really great coaching tool, actually. <laughs> break down we'll break mm -hmm. down the behavior into its component parts. Like, this is a good part. This is good. This part we could work on, you know, and then, and then just sort of really baby stepping, like you, yeah. like you say, line through new behaviors. Mm -hmm. Cause that, that example is really common. I hear from a lot of people. I, you know, I can be quote unquote good all day long and then I eat dinner. And the minute I sit on the couch to watch the next thing on Netflix or whatever, <laughs> It's so common and it's with everybody. Yeah. And I, I love that's because you're sitting down doing nothing. Right. Get up and go do something instead. Right. Mm -hmm. It's a great coaching tool. <laughs> oh my gosh. I wish we had more time. I have so many more questions. Can we, we just need to get you back on here. So hopefully we can. <laughs> Sounds good. <laughs> deal another hour, another time. But this, so the book, I'm going to go buy it too. And I, it sounds to me like there's a lot of fantastic, actionable tips that health coaches can actually use with their clients. Yeah, I think so. I really, I mean, I try to put as many things as I, as I say to my patients, I try to cram it in there um, without it being like disorganized. <laughs> mm -hmm. So um, that's my goal is like, it's really going to walk you through as much as something could walk you through. But yeah, definitely for health coaches, I think it would be a super useful tool to, mm -hmm. um, it, because what may not work for an individual, you want to have a bunch of different ideas as a health coach. Yeah. Right. I mean, and this is a, this is the time to strike. And, and if you, if you're a health coach listening to this and you, who knows when we're going to get through all of this, we, we have no idea. We have no line of sight on what's going to, how this is all going to shake out, but at the end of it, perhaps we will have an influx of prospective clients looking to dial back their diabetes, looking to dial back their, uh, their, their morbid obesity, their metabolic dysfunction. Maybe, maybe the health consumer will clue into the fact that the metabolically dysfunctional are the ones that really suffered. And maybe that will be an opportunity for coaches to tell people to reverse these conditions. So we need to be prepared, I think, mm -hmm. and optimistic that mm -hmm. the, health, the health consumers will take that step. We need to be there for them and ready with the information. So thank you for writing that book. And thank you for everything you share here today. Um, Thanks for having me on. It's, yes. It's, it's, I mean, I'm glad that we were able to pivot the conversation to something that's timely. Um, and I really appreciate you offering your, your guidance and expertise. Thanks so much for doing what you do and getting the information out and being coaches. <laughs> it's awesome. Thank you so much, Dr. Kate. This podcast was brought to you by Primal Health Coach Institute.
to learn more about how to become a successful health coach, get in touch with us by visiting primalhealthcoach.com forward slash call. Or if you're already a successful health coach, practitioner, influencer, or thought leader with a thriving business and an interesting story, we'd love to hear from you. Connect with us at hello at primalhealthcoach.com and let us know why we need to interview you for Health Coach Radio. Thanks for listening.